He's dead. So, um, actually, I can, yeah, I'll just wing it. Father teaches theology, biblical theology in Rome at one of the pontifical uh, universities. Um, he's a member of the Legionary of Christ, a religious community of priests, um, and he is one of our kind of experts on the Holy Shroud, having studied uh, a postgraduate um, um, certificate in Shroud Studies, and he teaches that now um, in Rome and goes all over the world uh, presenting on the Holy Shroud. Um, I kind of gave a little fun fact about him earlier, and I'm going to do it again. Uh, Father found his vocation to the priesthood while he was a student at Georgia Tech University, um, but he was not just a student there. He was also the mascot <laughs> for the football team. So I'll let, if he wants to say anything about that, I will let him do that. But please welcome Father Andrew Dalton, who is with us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Father. It's on. Okay, fine. A fun fact about uh, Buzz. So the mascot at Georgia Tech is, I know a lot of people call him a bumblebee, but we kind of take this personally. No, it's a yellow jacket. Okay, it's a yellow jacket. And what, the, the best part was at the beginning of the football games, you know, when the marching band is already out and they've done their number, and then the announcer takes the mic and says, and now, announcing the nation's number one mascot, Buzz! And he comes flying out of the, the tunnel, and he zigs and zags through the marching band and arrives at the 50-yard line and does the buzz flip, which is just a flip that he can't land. He just lands on his back and then jumps up and shakes it off, kind of wiggles it off, and then makes his way to the swarm. That's the student section where they're all in white and gold, and he just body surfs into the stadium, which was great. That, this was the hard part. You know when, like, the disciples... They couldn't leave their nets to, to go follow Christ. That was like the emblem of all that kind of tied them down. For me, it was buzz. It was, it was the hard part. Never mind that you're going to give up a wife and kids and family. The, yellow, the, the letter jacket that was waiting for me from the cheerleading squad for being, for being buzz. That's what, but I said goodbye to that uniform at last and got a new one. So here we are. Anyway, those were fun days. I, I can't wait on, on my way back home. I fly back through Atlanta, and I get a 24-hour layover in that land that I love. All my family has moved away. My parents are in Sarasota, Florida. My sisters are in Seattle. I have no reason to go back home where I, where I grew up. So those are precious memories, and I, I always feel tied. Um, speaking of which, you know what mom and dad got me for Christmas? Because just before I came here, I spent four days with them. And my mom knows how much I miss certain things about American, one of them is peanut butter. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you can get peanut butter, it was like this size, and it's like 16 euros, that's ridiculous. So I've got, she wanted to give me six pounds of peanut butter. I said, Ma, I, can't, I don't have room in my luggage for this. And so I got three pounds, just three pounds. All right, so on that note, <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about the shroud, but I wanna, I want to situate this because, you know, today's the 10th day of Christmas. We're still in the, the 12 tide, right? How many leopards are leaping or what? How's that go on today? I'm not even sure. But um, do you know, I was revisiting that part of the catechism that talks about why the word became flesh. And it gives four reasons that I like to remember with a little acronym, SLED, uh, S-L-E-D. The word became flesh, S, you can probably guess, why? To, to save us, indeed, to save us from sin, to save us for eternal life, right? Okay, help me with this one. L, he came us to, to show us his love, right? So he makes manifest divine love in his human nature. And then E, this one's a little tricky, in order that we might follow his example, or there it is, said the words, I'm trying to, I was trying to cue you up with the E, but... Yeah, to give us an example, to exemplify a Christian life. Well, so Christ, the head, goes before those of us who are his members to exemplify the moral life, the, the life uh, of the Christian. And then here's, here's the trickiest one of all. I wonder if anybody has the magic word here. What's the D? The word became flesh. He who is God took on our human nature. He took on our humanity that we might take on his. What do we call that? To, to what? Divinity, yeah. So to, to divinize or to deify us. 
Do you know that St. Thomas Aquinas would say this? He said, God became man, that man might become God. That's Second Peter 1, 4 says, we're partakers of the divine nature. And this, above all, I think is the least known reason and perhaps the most profound, that grace makes us like unto God. It christens us. And um, I think that helps us to enter into what we're about to talk about. Because Jesus, who is born and laid in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes, will soon be wrapped in a linen shroud. He'll descend into death. In fact, isn't it true? I think we could say he was born to die. He was born to offer a redemptive death that didn't end in the grave, but he rose to new life. But remember what he says on the road to Emmaus? Like, was it not necessary that the Messiah suffer these things so as to enter into glory? Which is exactly what he wants to share with us. But the via crucis opens up into a via lucis. The way of the cross is the way of light. And um, I hope I can connect the dots to all that (laughs) and what we're about to see. But let's segue from Christmas to The Paschal mystery, which to sum up, dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. That's what we're going to talk about, okay? And we're going to use the shroud to help us because the shroud indeed is mentioned precisely in the context of the resurrection. Not once, not twice, but three times in a passage that you know very well. I know you know it because we proclaim it on Easter Sunday every year at the morning mass. And let's just rehearse that quickly. What happens? Do you remember how Mary Magdalene gets up early that day? Um, But not early. It's still dark, but the body's already gone. So she goes to run and tell um, Simon Peter and the beloved disciple, the one whom tradition recognizes as John, John the Evangelist, John one of the 12. And so they come running to the tomb. But John is faster. He gets there first. And yet he doesn't go in. I love this little detail you could so easily miss or just dismiss. It says he stoops. And stooping, he looks in. And looking, he sees the burial cloths. Okay, why do I get so excited about the stooping business? Well, did anybody go to the Holy Land here? Maybe you would have seen this. Who's been to Israel? Quite a few? Okay, over here, quite a few. Maybe in, in Nazareth or down south in Jerusalem, even just a short walk from the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, there's a place called Herod's tomb. Um, you can see this type of geography. Namely, uh, uh, here's the surface, then there's a stairwell that goes down. It gives access to a portal. That's where the stone would be. In fact, you could. we have sliding glass doors. They had rounded stones in the in the ground, and then stones could be rolled over the the curvature of that stone in a way that sealed this door shut. And then you enter in, and you'd be inside of a kind of antechamber, and then against this back wall, you see here what's called an arco solium. That's the arch and then the the sill or the, the table. And on that surface would lie the body. We know that there's two types of tombs in Israel. This is the more exalted type, those who had a little more more means. Um, The other type is just a hole in the wall, and they put the head in and the feet after. And why do we know it's not that way in the gospel? Do you remember on that one passage, there's an angel at his head and at his feet? If he's just in that box version, those angels were like Smurfs to get in in such a space. Um, But it's much more likely that even from the scriptural data that we get, that he's in arcosolium. And sure enough, with that stairwell down, it maps onto that version very well. Well, if there's a stairwell and John wants to look inside, but he doesn't want to step down those stairs, he's got to get low. Because if he's standing tall, how is he going to see way in? Does that make sense? So he stoops. I love that that detail is recorded by Luke and by John, and it It corresponds to what we know about first century tombs. Very cool. But that's that's not all. When he sees from a distance, he sees burial cloths or linen cloths. 
This word in Greek is othonia, othonia. And the reason that's worthy of note is that in Matthew and Mark and Luke, we sometimes get the word syndone instead. Syndone is the word shroud, and it's singular. And we know it's big because, hey, do you remember that? Syndone and runs away naked. So evidently, a syndone is big enough to cover the human body. It's not a tank top, okay? <laughs> so a syndone is a, long, a big sheet of sorts. Okay, so we know Jesus was buried, according to Matthew and Mark and Luke, in a syndone, a long sheet. But here we are on Easter Sunday. Okay, so Good Friday has passed. Holy Saturday has passed. Easter Sunday has passed. John discovers from a distance he sees the linen cloths with an S, okay? What's there? Well, presumably what was there on Friday, namely the shroud, but something else, something in addition to the shroud. Otherwise, why the plural word, okay? So track with me. Watch what happens next because we're going to get more mention of these cloths in the very next verse and the next one after that. Because now, huffing and puffing comes poor old Peter trying to keep up <laughs> with, with John, and now he goes in. I can just imagine John saying, after you, Holy Father, please, we're waiting for you. Come on. <laughs> and he goes down those stairs and inside, beyond the, the, the stone, and he sees more details. He sees, sure, the linen cloths, not from a distance. He sees them up close. And, and now he adds a part of participle. He says, these linens are lying. Okay, I'm not sure why that's important yet, but hang on to that. And he says he also sees the sudarium, the, the, the face cloth that had covered his head. Well, it's rolled up or folded up separately in a place by itself. I'm like, great. Thank you, John the Evangelist, for all these wonderful details about the dirty laundry on the ground. It's like, why, why are we talking about this? Like, isn't it true that there are a thousand details about the passion of Christ that you and I would love to know, and then the gospel just doesn't give it to us? It's painfully discreet about so many of the sufferings that, that we like to meditate upon, and we'd love to get more information about the crowning with thorns, about the scourging, about the, the length of the nails, or the manner of crucifixion, or the weight of the wood that he carried, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, we don't get it. But, oh, in this moment... The gospel writer is going on and on about these linens on the ground or lying there. And so when the gospel writer zigs, when you thought he was going to zag, that's exactly the moment to pause and ask, why? What are you doing? And look at the very next verse. In verse 8, John, the beloved disciple, goes in after Peter, and he sees and believes. Do you remember that line? He saw and believed. We got to take that seriously. If at least what John says is true in one of his epistles, he says, if um, Jesus isn't raised from the dead, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. In other words, the entire system of Christianity is scaffolded upon this foundation. You slip out that foundation and down, down comes the whole, the whole system, the whole Why do we believe? Well, what I think is interesting is that the first baby steps towards faith in the resurrection are connected to the discovery of the so-called empty tomb. Isn't that what we call it? The empty tomb? Is that not funny? Like, we're reading the gospel passage that goes out of its way to describe not so much its emptiness, but its contents, because it's what they find in the way that they find it, because they find it there, that they begin to believe. In other words, it's not that he sees something and says, huh, despite what I see, I'll believe anyway. No, it's in light of what he saw that he believed. So what did he see so that he believed it? Why is it that I see dirty laundry in the, on the ground and I've got to just jump to the conclusion that what, he's risen from the dead? How does, how does that work? Explain, right? I wish I could jump in one of those uh, Michael J. Fox time machines and like reconstruct the scene. I Obviously, I can't do that, but... Um, let's try anyway. Here, I'm going to give an analogy. I hope this works. So 
I'm in the rectory next door. Let's say I have an extra piece of, I had a chicken at Colton's tonight, not so far away from here. So let's say I have an extra filet and um, I want to save it for later. So I wrap it in saran wrap, right? And I, uh, or plastic wrap, you know, I put it in the fridge. And um, so Father Jones doesn't, you know, take my, my chicken. Later, I'll, I'll just put a padlock on that uh, fridge. Now, now I can safely go away, you know, uh, maybe for a weekend. Imagine I come back and on day three, the, the padlock is busted open on the ground. I, I open the, the fridge door I, where I left my, my filet. It's same exact position and orientation. The plastic wrap, but guess what? No chicken, <laughs> right? What would happen to the wrappings? Well, they'd collapse. They'd lie flat. That's the one modifier, the one descriptor we get of this cloth, and we get it twice. In fact, the word kemena is there three times. And so could it be that John was there on Friday? He saw the linens and as they lay, and now he sees them again in the exact same way, except no contents. The reason I mention that is because according to the American scientists, there's a depression in the beard that gives evidence perhaps of a strip that kept the mouth shut, and perhaps even more interesting, a, a strip that goes around the legs, out beyond, that is on the outside of the long linen that wrapped the body, now an outer strip that keeps the legs together. And so I think that's interesting because there's a crease, I should describe this, between the heels and the knees, there is evidence of a crease a strip that bound the legs. And so, to my mind, that makes sense of, of the data, especially when considered John chapter 11, where it describes yet another Jewish burial in the same book, John. And there it's Lazarus who's in the tomb. And you remember how Jesus calls him out? Lazarus, come out. What's the next word out of his mouth? Untie him. Evidently, there's something to untie. And so might it be that yet in another burial, Jesus too was not just in a shroud. A, one, a long sheet, but even strips. That would make sense of the statement, he saw and he believed. I'll add yet another element here. And this is hard to sense in our English translation because we read... He saw, he saw, he saw. John saw from a distance. Peter saw up close. And then John enters in after and he saw and believed. You would assume that that's the same word in the original Greek. It's not. Three different vocabulary words. And what I think he's using is what we would call a literary device to cue us into the fact that there's sight and then there's sight. There's natural vision that regular organs perceive, and then there's supernatural faith, which comes as a grace of God. And so there's reason, and then there's graced reason. What's graced reason? Faith. So it's not that we have to crucify our reason, as some philosophers understood, in order to believe. We need to elevate or perfect our reason. And there's St. Thomas Aquinas. Grace is not destroyed, it's perfected. It's elevated. And so our itinerary needs to mirror that gospel. By all means, see from a distance, look. Even better if you go inside and scrutinize. Even better if you see and believe. But that's not even the end point. We move from reason to faith to finally encounter. Mary Magdalene, the one who sat at the beginning of this passage, is re rejoices to find out that that gardener is no gardener at all. It's the risen Lord. But she doesn't notice it until he speaks her name, Mary. And she turns and, Rabuni, right? And then embraces him. That's got to be our story. Begin with questions, with curiosity. Proceed into faith. And then meet the Lord who lives. That's what we do in every Eucharist, by the way. All right, so now I hope it's clear why 
Christians would be interested in the shroud. If that's the linen that wrapped my Lord, if that's the blood that was shed for my salvation, if that's the face of God himself, obviously that's going to tug on my heartstrings when, when I look with eyes of faith. But what I want you to know is it's not just, it's not just Christians who are interested, but even scientists, even a secular scientists are interested in the shroud. And why? Because it's a great mystery. It's an unsolved mystery to this day. How did this image get on the cloth? Okay, so as soon as you talk science, I know it immediately pops into people's heads. Um, my teacher is uh, Barry Schwartz. I don't know if anybody knows of, of Barry Schwartz, but he is a, a Jewish gentleman who travels the world uh, speaking on the shroud. And even though he believes in the authenticity of the shroud, he's not himself a believer in the Christian sense. Um, but he's, it's just the empirical data alone that has brought him to this conclusion. Well, he says when he travels the world, he's on the plane, he says, if I don't want to have a conversation, I'll just say, I'm a writer. But he says, if he kind of wants to get into it with the you know, travel buddy by his side, he'll say, oh, I, I speak on the shroud. And, the, and they'll usually say one of two things. One is, what's that? I never heard of it. The number two thing he'll say is, oh, the shroud, that was proven to be a medieval fake, right? Maybe you've seen these headlines from 1988. See, the Turin shroud shown to be a fake. In fact, we are 95% sure that it dates to 1260 to 1390 because that's what three different laboratories determined, Arizona and Zurich and Oxford. And they're so sure, like, it deserves an exclamation mark because, hey, that's what scientists do, right? And so look at this posture, by the way. Doesn't that just scream like humility? That's what that screams, right? Humility. Um, but for, what, for whatever reason, it went down like that. And the sad upshot of that was that for about 18, 19 years, that was the majority report about the shroud. It's from the Middle Ages. It can't therefore pertain to the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth because, hey, he's from the first century, right? And so the shroud was kind of dismissed. All right, well, we are in a very different position today, especially as of 2015, but even more 2018, 2019, because of the more recent publications. But you know, I'll tell you ever so briefly, a certain researcher, uh, a French researcher by the name of Tristan Casabianca, um, filed a Freedom of Information Act against the British Museum. He, do you know that in 88, they didn't release the raw data from which they drew their conclusions. They just said, trust us, this is where the conclusions have got to lead. <laughs> but now, only because impelled by law, compelled by law, they had to release the raw data. And the raw data shows that not only is the corner snippet that they tested anomalous vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the shroud, but it's heterogeneous amongst its component parts. That's a complicated way of saying that it's utterly unlike the rest of the shroud, okay? Do you know that if you look at the brightness map that shows the chemical composition of the shroud as a whole, it's, it's homogenous, it's the same. It's all warm hues, orange, maybe a little yellow, a little red, but it's one and the same in its chemical composition, except for the top left corner, which is, I kid you not, forest green. I, I, a kindergartner, quite literally, could look at that and say, look, mom, that part is different. And that's exactly where they take the sample, four centimeters of that top left corner. Did they, they ought to have known that 10 years prior to 1988, and yet they do their tests just the same. Well, isn't it, isn't it would you know that even according to the mainstream science today, it's not, it's not a contentious point of view that I'm presenting to you. Even those who don't believe in the authenticity of the shroud have to recognize because that those tests of 1988 are inconclusive. They promised that they were 95% sure. Now they promise they're not. Okay? So that's all to say the shroud is fair game in a new way. So I want to present some of the evidence. You know, just like good scientists, if you have 99 tests that point in the direction of authenticity 
and one points in the other direction. What is it, the scientific thing to do to dismiss the 99? And it's, it's, it's not the gospel sheep, right, that goes its own way. You, you, take, you take into consideration all, all the evidence. And that's what I want to do in the brief time that we have to get. I'm going to give you what I think is some of the best of the best. You could spend a whole year at a pontifical university studying a postgraduate certificate in Shroud Studies. I can't, I can't deliver it all, but I will try to hit some of the highlights tonight. One of the highlights is definitely this moment, 1898, the, the moment that this amateur photographer snaps the first photo of the shroud. This is modern technology, and it had just come out about 60 years prior, the, the first dactylographs. But Secondo Pia is tasked with photographing the shroud in such a way that he would have to go into the dark room and develop the photo negative of the shroud. A photo negative had never been seen of the shroud. Okay, so it's been venerated presumably for long centuries. But what were we looking at? We're looking at this. This is the shroud as it looks in Turin. Okay, this is the face. I don't know if you can make it. If, if you're not used to seeing this face, it might be really hard to pick out what I'm even looking at. Here's eyes, a nose, mustache or mouth, really the lips. Here's the the beard down here, the forehead, this is where the, the blood is from, from the, the center of the forehead. But let's face it, you kind of have to squint and get a little creative to make out the face. Um, for example, if I were to ask you, how do, what do you make of the eyes? It might not be obvious to all of us that the eyes are closed. You might interpret this to be the eyes are open, and look, these are the eyeballs, these are the outlines of the eyes, and we have like a Bart Simpson kind of thing going on here with these huge eyeballs. And is it a cartoonish face? You might think so if all you had to go on was this, what we call the positive image. But remember, Secundo Pia is the first to look at the negative. Look now at the negative. Notice now the subtleties, the contours around the eyes that, that reveal the, subtle, the subtleties of the eye sockets, the separation between the lips, the beard that separated, the inflammation in the cheeks, uh, many, many details that I want to continue to point out as we move forward here. But the first thing to be noticed in this era, right at the turn of the century, is the anatomical perfection of this body. And I want to be clear what I'm talking about when I, I use that terminology, anatomical perfection. We're usually talking about two things. One, the morphology, that is the shape of the body, the proportions, like what's the distance between the two eyes and then to the tip of the nose and then to the bottom of the chin, the head as its, its ratio to the full length of the body, anatomical perfection as to the shape of the body. Two, anatomical perfection as to the pathologies that this man has suffered, which is very hard. And we're going to talk about the complicated issues that involve the blood stains, but they map onto what we read about in the scriptures, how Jesus was crowned, he was scourged, he was made to carry the cross, he was then crucified, so nails in his hands and feet, and then pierced in the side. That's a very unique set of combination of sufferings, and they're, they're described here with anatomical precision. And some of these elements get very complex, and I hope to, to draw that out in a moment. But this is the first thing to be noticed by a certain agnostic in France. His name is Yves Delage. And he will write a paper, and the conclusion of this paper is that the man of the shroud is Jesus of Nazareth. Keep in mind, this is not a Christian. He's, just, he's not making faith claims when he says this. He's simply saying that the pathologies that are recorded here correspond to that historical person that we know as Jesus of Nazareth. Well, instead of applauding his erudition, they point fingers at him to say, what are you kidding me? <laughs> he was ostracized from, we're not going to publish this in the Académie de Science. And he, he has to write his colleague and say, if I were writing about Xerxes or some pharaoh, no one would have anything to say. I don't understand why they're scandalized 
that there is a trace of Jesus' material existence. And yet, it's the case today too, right? When we speak about Jesus, oftentimes the reactions are vehement, right? Visceral. Well, that's the way it happened at the turn of the century. Turns out Jesus always and everywhere is a sign of contradiction. So don't, don't be surprised if not everybody jumps on board. But some truth seekers, like Barry Schwartz, like Yves Delage, even if they're not Christians, can happily recognize that this is that person we all recognize is Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, we don't talk about fables or fairy tales when we talk about the Gospels. We're talking about a historical event. And when you're talking about substantiating a historical event, you're looking for two things principally, a monumentum and a documentum. And even better if you get that in the plural, right? Monumenta and documenta. What are the documents? Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then there's Tacitus and Josephus and Suetonius and whatnot, right? But then you also have monumenta. In this case, the monuments are two linens, the shroud and the sudarium. And they too bear witness to the same. That is a peg. That's an anchor in history. And that's of interest to us because the incarnation is not a fable or a fairy tale. It's not a myth in that sense. No, it's an event that God took our flesh and in that flesh suffered a redemptive death. Okay, so might it be that we're looking at a snapshot of our Lord? I mean, if that's the case, I would have asked him, Jesus, if you're only going to give us one, make it cool. Like, how about the transfiguration or when you're walking on water, or when you're doing something spectacular? And go figure, he didn't consult me first. Like, he, he picked this. But what's amazing to me is that the event that is here, it encapsulates the two central mysteries of our faith. The incarnation, right? That the enfleshment, a divine person takes on our human nature because he who is immortal by nature now is able to die in ours. And so the incarnation, this is a dead body. It's a corpse that we see on the shroud. But then the resurrection. It could be that what we're looking at, this image on the shroud, is nothing less than the natural effect of a supernatural event. Namely, when that corpse rises to a new state of glory. That's what we call the resurrection. He now lives forever, no longer subject to death. Well, could it be that this image is impressed upon the cloth in the very moment those eyes now open, that this bruised and beaten body now rises to, to glory, it could just be that we have a testament then to the resurrection and the incarnation in one picture. And that seems interesting to me. I always wondered, like, are we second-rate Christians just because by happenstance we're born in the 20th or 21st century and not in the first or could it be that he who drew close to the 12 back then wants to even be close to us, even give us a, some semblance of his own visage? They got to talk with him. They got to ask him questions. They got to see him face to face. Might he want to give that gift to all of us? Well, I, if so, I think it fitting, nevertheless. Well, it's not just Secondo Pia who studied um, the facial image, the Notice the photographic quality of the cloth. A professional photographer repeats the experiment in 1931. His name is Giuseppe Enrie. And indeed, the shroud as a whole acts as a photo document. Where the grayscale is inverted, you don't arrive at a photo negative. No, the negative is the positive image. <laughs> this is the positive, right? Well, no, that must be the negative because the negative of this is the positive. This is so confusing. I feel like I'm in arithmetic. It's like the negative of the negative is a po The point is this. Let's make it simple. How is it possible that we have a photographic document 18 centuries before the invention of photography? Right? This is what's going to catch the attention of the scientific community. 
they want to ask one simple question. How did we get this image? Because it's one of a kind. It anatomically perfect in morphology and in pathology. Two, it acts as a photographic document unlike any other burial cloth. And then three is what we're going to find out when we fast forward to the modern era. Now, it's not 1898 anymore. It's 1976. And two American scientists from the United States Air Force Academy, Eric Jumper and John Jackson, apply, well, they slip an image of the shroud under the VP-8 image analyzer, which was instrumentation which was used, amongst other things, by NASA scientists to map the topography of planets without having to travel there. You know, you could see where the hills and the valleys are, where the contours go up and down. Could it, could it make a read on a photograph? Normal photographs tell you nothing about the shape of the human body under a VP8. But this image, the image of the face of the man of the shroud, actually shows three-dimensional information which corresponds to the contours of a human face, unlike any other photograph we have. Let's make it simple one more time. The cloth is flat. It's 2D, and yet it encodes 3D information. That is to say, if you go to Rome or to Jerusalem or to any one of our Athonia exhibits throughout the world, you'll see a statue of the man of the shroud in his three-dimensionality. The reason you can see such a thing and touch it even is because that information was given in the cloth itself, and yet nobody laid eyes on it until Eric Jumper and John Jackson in 1976. So this discovery, this visualization of the three-dimensional information that's encoded in the cloth is going to catalyze what is called the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or for short, short STIRP. So for one full year, the highest powered laboratories in America, 20 of them, get together so as to prepare for a test, a full battery of tests. And here we're talking every sector of science, physics, chemistry, biology, x-ray, infrared, spectroscopy, paralysis mass spectroscopy, pollen samples, sticky tape samples, blood samples. And they're trying to determine an answer to one question, which is not a religious one. It's simply this, what formed the image? How did it get there? By what means, by what mechanism is this image impressed upon the cloth? And so they said, well, toss out some theories. You guys know the scientific method. What's the hypothesis? There were principally four. One was that it was a painting. Two was that it was a scorch. You know, like you heat up a statue and then drop the cloth on top. Maybe it leaves like a little singe on the, on the surface of the fibers. If it's not a painting or a scorch, maybe it's a rubbing. You ever do that experiment in kindergarten where you put the leaf under the, on the loose leaf paper and then with your crayon you kind of rub on top? Maybe that's the, the way the shroud image was formed. Another possibility was that it was a camera oscura, some sort of medieval photography. Maybe Leonardo da Vinci uh, really invented photography uh, before 1826. We, you just didn't know it. Anyway, these were some of the theories that were on the table. Well, the frustration is that they go overseas with 80 crates of the most state-of-the-art material. Here they are on the bottom left corner, almost create an international fiasco when they don't get through customs with this stuff. And then, sure enough, they get through, they get five days, 122 consecutive hours to do their test that they've micromanaged for a year so that they can get the most bang for their buck. But just to anticipate the results of this test, they come home with more questions than answers because they disprove all four possibilities. They know it's not a painting because guess what? There's no paint, no pigment, organic or inorganic, no varnish, no dye, no ink, no brush strokes, no directionality with, with, with which color is applied to the cloth. Nothing is soaked to the medulla of the fibers. It's just a surface phenomenon. It's such a superficial phenomenon that if we were to take light to the other side of the cloth, like we drop down the lights on this side. Imagine I walk to the other side of the, the shroud with transmitted light, with just a regular light bulb. You would see the blood stains, 
because the blood is soaked into the fibers. Now backlit, it's all the more visible. But the, the man's image, his face, his body, disappears. The light on the other side is too, it overpowers it. It's so subtle, it's so frail, it's so superficial. If, if we were to take a, a, a razor blade and just gently graze over the surface of the fibers, you would erase forever the image of the man because it's just the surface fibers that are colorized. And so how superficial is this phenomenon? I could, I could give you the number. I'll tell you, it's 200 to 500 nanometers. But I don't even know what a nanometer is. It's, it's too small to imagine. This is one-fifth of one-thousandth of a millimeter. That's the depth of penetration of coloration on the shroud. That's like taking a, a single human hair and dividing it into 20 equal parts. One sixteenth or one twentieth the width of a human hair. That's how deep the color goes. We don't have a micro laser today in 2024 that is capable of delivering a micro burn this precise. The technology simply does not exist. And so maybe just think twice when you're going through the grocery aisle around Easter probably and you see in the tabloids, you know, top 10 religious fakes as I saw one time, Shroud was number three. Uh, really? Like, here's my challenge for those who would be inclined to think that the Shroud is the work of a con artist or a forger or some sorts. Just do it again. Just one time, right? Look, it was made in the Middle Ages. Isn't that the idea? Well, certainly today, we've got more means to produce it again. Are you going to tell me we're, we're more technologically advanced in thir the year 1300 than we are now? Well, then by what natural means was it produced? It certainly wasn't a painting. It's not a scorch, the ultraviolet, the fluorescence proves that. It's not a rubbing. There's no highlights. There's no shadows on the cloth. It's not, it's not a camera oscura. Well, then what is it? This is what the Sterp team will uh, conclude. After all their tests, it comes down to this simple statement. The image of the man of the shroud is not artwork. Isn't that interesting, the way they phrased that? They didn't tell you what it is. They told you what it's not. And so it's an open question, even today. What means, what mechanism made this image? So I always like to say to my friend Barry, who his, his position is this. Look, I don't know. I don't know what made it. I know it's not a rubbing. I know it's not a scorch. I know it's not a, a camera. I know it's not a painting. Uh, maybe tomorrow we'll figure out something else. And so he holds out. Meanwhile, Christians raise their hands to say, well, wait a minute. What if, it's, what if it's not any natural means whatsoever? Maybe we shouldn't fall into the naturalism that presupposes that it's impossible for supernatural events to take place. Maybe we should be open to the idea that the shroud is the result of the resurrection itself. Open, open. And then look to where the evidence leads. So let's keep, let's keep studying here. I gotta show you some of the basics about the cloth because there are four major marks that you need to know about. One is that there's blood. Two is that there's water stains. Three is that there are fire marks, burns, right? And then it's the fourth mark that's most interesting and that's the body image. Okay, so we'll look to this in a moment, but I want you to look at this body image now more closely. Okay, so Jesus is, of course, in the vertical position on the cross, but then when he's laid in the tomb, he's lying horizontal, obviously. But see how this shroud is so long that it wraps both below him and above him? So that when we unfold the cloth, we get this. So this is, a, this is Vanna White and the angels that are showing off the... The shroud. No, but what they're showing off is one side of the cloth. Okay, this is important. That's the only side that has the body on it. If you look to the other side, you see nothing. Okay, so this is what's called the frontal image. On the left, it corresponds to this here. On the right, you have what's called the dorsal image. That's what you see here. It's what corresponds to what's underneath the body. Okay, 14 foot long. That's how, how, this, how big this is. It's touching both the front and the body. We get both sides. I want you to understand that it's the mirror image. So 
Look at this. See how the right side of the chest is pierced? And so it looks on the shroud that it's the left side of the chest. Well, which one is it? Well, just think of when you stand in front of the mirror. You know, when you raise your right hand, the guy in the mirror raises his left. And so the shroud is that mirror. So what, what's going to happen is when you look at the photo negative, and here I've turned up the contrast, they flip the image back. That is to say, now look, it's the right side that's pierced, not as it is in the positive image, but as on the body itself. So that's just a visual help so that you can interpret the image uh, more intelligently. All right, so that was it's just something to understand what we're looking at. Sometimes we get so quickly immersed in the, um, in the minutia because it's so fascinating that we miss some of the more obvious contradictions, or at least the seeming contradictions. One of them is that the man who is crucified, the one that's crowned with thorns, the one that's scourged, the one that's brutally tortured all the way up until death, is the same that is buried as a king? Look at this burial cloth, 14 foot long. How, who is paying for such a cloth? Especially when you understand that this is herringbone weave. Can you see the diagonal lines that go this way and that? That is comparable to a liturgical garment of a priest. And it's gigantic. Who is purchasing it? Does anybody remember who, according to the gospel, makes this purchase? Nicodemus indeed buys something. He buys 100 pounds. That's like 75 of our pounds of aloe. So yeah, and Nicodemus is a member of the Sanhedrin. In other words, he's the upper crust. But somebody else provides his own rock-hewn tomb. Who's that? There we go. Joseph of Arimathea, who's also a member of the Sanhedrin. In other words, also an elite status. Luke's gospel tells us he's a wealthy man. Well, this wealthy man asked permission from Pontius Pilate to take down Jesus. And when he does, he buys a cloth. Well, when a man like that goes to buy a cloth for this purpose, for a man who's esteemed as he is, what kind of cloth does he buy? A very pricey one. So what ought to be a stumbling block, a man is what, a criminal and a king at the same time? actually coincides exactly with the gospel data. And so it makes good sense of it. Jesus had friends in high places. Jesus has enemies who could administer capital punishment. So let's get into these sufferings, the physical sufferings of Jesus. This is perhaps what you might take home with you in the most fruitful way. I know we are used to seeing crosses in our living room. Some of us wear it around our neck. I wonder if we're desensitized to it. We're so used to it. We, we don't even blink anymore when we see Jesus, Jesus. Do you know, I have a Protestant sister. They don't have crucifixes in their church. They have um, empty crosses. They're Presbyterians. My little nephew came into the church where when I was ordained, I was celebrating my, my first mass, and a giant crucifix is behind the altar. And my six-year-old uh, nephew, Jeremiah, is like, look, mom, it's Jesus on the cross. During the Mass, he's drawing these pictures of the blood flowing out of the heart of Jesus and into the, to the chalice. I was like, watch out, kid. You're destined for greatness here. But we, we understand this idea, don't we, that the sufferings of Jesus are precious to us because they reveal the heart of Christ. It's not some morbid fixation in suffering that we have. It's that we understand that this is the language of love. When divine love is translated into a human language, it looks like this. It looks like sacrifice, love plus suffering. And so that's why I spend some time on these, these horrible, horrible sufferings. And um, so that's just a little caveat. I like to quote Pope Benedict XVI, who said, this is love in its most radical form. We need this. This is not superfluous. It's not like icing on the cake or the cherry on top. Like, maybe we'll have devotion to the passion, maybe not. Look at what Pope St. John Paul II said. There is no Christian holiness apart from devotion to the passion. 
because there is no holiness apart from the paschal mystery. This is not extra. This is the meat and potatoes of the Christian life right here. All right, so the agony is where it all begins, right? Perhaps you could even rewind a little bit more into the Last Supper, because that's where Jesus says, look, this is my body which is offered. This is, this is the blood that is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. But Jesus isn't suffering physically, right? It's just a sacramental anticipation of what's about to play out in the flesh. So it gives us a lens to understand what's about to take place. He's going to make a gift of his life, which is why it's true that he can say, nobody takes my life from me. I, already, I lay it down of my own accord. You can't take what's already been given. <laughs> and Jesus gave it at the Last Supper. Now, when, when he steps out of the Last Supper, remember he crosses the Kidron Valley and goes up the other side to the Garden of Gethsemane on Mount Olivet. And there he's, he's praying three times. He says, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And we might think that was an easy prayer, but Luke helps us understand what it is to enter into the heart of the Christ. Matthew helps too. Matthew says it like this, and my soul is sorrowful unto death. Jesus begins to die, not on Friday, but even on Thursday night, which makes sense of, by the way, remember when he says, the sign of Jonah, remember, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so too the Son of Man. So Jesus is entering into death as of the Last Supper, making a gift of his life. And so sorrowful unto death, there's a spiritual dying that is already taking place in his agony. And as he's agonizing, this is what Luke, the doctor, has to say. Being in agony Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Do you know that we have peer-reviewed scientific journal articles that describe what we call hematidrosis? Hematidrosis, that's just the words blood, sweat, sickness, if you like. Okay, what is hematidrosis? The doctors describe it like this. Under your subcutaneous layer of skin, you have your blood vessels. You know how your arteries taper into capillaries before they become veins? Those thinnest of all blood vessels, they become distended and burst. Not because somebody's beating up on you. They're not. The stress, the, the, the notion, the, 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 yeah, I, think, I don't know if there's a better word than stress, that Jesus is aware of what he's entering into. His soul is sorrowful unto death. And this is how it plays out in the body. His blood vessels explode. And now the hemorrhage underneath the surface of the skin, it exits out of the adjacent sweat pores. And so you get little red or purple dots appearing on the surface of the skin, leaving the biggest organ of your body, which is the skin, sensitive now to touch in a way that it wasn't before. And so just to draw breath, just to blow a puff of air, just to <sighs> over the surface of the skin, after having suffered hematidrosis, feels like pain. And so do you know, it took me a year and a half to notice the first physical violence that man afflicts upon Jesus after this moment? Because I always just skipped ahead to the more dramatic parts, but think of it. What initiates the sufferings? How, who, who is it that arrests Jesus? His fans, his followers? No, it's... It's not people who know him. So who's going to give the cue? Who's going to tell him who Jesus is? Judas, with the sign, I heard you say it, of the kiss. And it, it took me, like, I it took my breath away to think that that kiss registered in his body as physical pain because he had already endured hematidrosis. And that's poignant. That's that's fitting, because that kiss ought to have been a sign of love and loyalty. But he turns it upside down and makes it the sign of his betrayal. Arrest him. And so he walks up with a, a nonchalance that is chilling. He steps in front of Jesus to say, Hail, Rabbi. Do you know the word hail, by the way? In Greek is rejoice. What, what irony. Rejoice. 
and then gives a kiss. My friend, do you betray me with a kiss, Jesus says back. And that kiss is going to be the first chain of events, the first domino to fall. But now it climaxes in crucifixion the next day. Of course, that's delivered by Pontius Pilate. But remember what Jesus said of him. He who handed me over to you, Pontius Pilate, has what? The greater sin. And so it hurts the heart of Jesus more because this was his inner circle. This was one of the chosen 12. It's like the Psalm says, you know, the Father and I often read in the Psalms on Friday, the Liturgy of the Hours, Psalm 55, it goes like this. Had my enemy betrayed me, I could bear his taunts, but it was you, my intimate friend, my close companion. He says, his words are like butter, but they pierce like javelins. This is a window into the spiritual reality of Christ as his friend, the one who witnessed his preaching, his miracles, now betrays him. And what a betrayal, with a kiss. So think of that. It's, it's a picture of what sin is. Sin is not a broken rule, an infraction of a norm. It is, it is the betrayal of a friend, the one who loved me into life, the one who calls me to glory. And, and this, is, this is what we priests especially have to contemplate. Or those of us who are all priests by virtue of our baptism. We've received way more than Judas, by the way having received him in Holy Communion again and again and again. How many times into confession? How many times receiving his graces, his mercies? All right. So what happens right after the arrest? Well, they bring him to, pun- to not to punch his pilot. That happens on Friday. This is Thursday night. And so in the middle of the night, against all the rules and cobbling together the portion of the Sanhedrin that they can at that hour, they bring false witnesses, and they try to get Jesus a death sentence. And so it's frustrating when the false witnesses aren't agreeing amongst themselves. It's like, this is a botched job. Jesus can sleep in his own bed that night if he just stays silent. Which is, by the way, if I were his lawyer, that's exactly the strategy I'd employ. Jesus, you just zip it, right? Plead the fifth. They're going to accuse you? Well, don't make the case for them. They have got the one, they are the ones that have got to bring the evidence to you. But Jesus is, seems to be following this strategy. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opens not his mouth for most of the time. But Caiaphas sees that Jesus is slipping through his fingertips, and so he takes matters into his own hands. He says, I adjure you, Jesus. That is to say, I put you under solemn oath. I who am the high priest, I who sit in Moses' seat, whose seat, the authority of which you recognized? Well, I'm asking this of you, Jesus. Are you what? What's the question? What's the killer question that gets Jesus a death sentence? I like to ask the kids this question. I'm wondering wondering if you know. Early, are you the son of God that's in there? Are you, what else? The Messiah, there it is. Are you the Christ and the son of God? Is that an important question? Evidently, Mark thought it was. What's the opening line of Mark's gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ and Son of God. That's those two titles. Now they reappear at the end of the gospel, this climactic trial. Jesus, who are you? Are you the Christ and the Son of God? And up until this point, Jesus, who had been so silent, so disciplined, loses his cool, or does he? Like, Because at this question... When he's got nothing to gain and everything to lose, but so that you and I might know with what conviction he held his own profession of who it was, who he is, he says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's like bad timing, Jesus, right? Like, to quote the two key messianic passages of the Old Testament, Psalm 110 Daniel 7, 13, and 4, and then apply those passages to yourself when they're itching to put you to death? You're serving it up for them on a silver platter? What's, the, what's going on here? I think he wanted you and I to know just how firmly he held that conviction. And that, how else can you explain such an answer? But that he willed to say it in such a way, in such a context, that we couldn't call it into question. 
Why did he go to, the, to his death? Because he was an insurrectionist? Because he didn't pay the temple tax? Because he was some competitor king to, what, Caesar? No, because he claimed to be the Christ and the Son of God. That is what, that's the, that's the cue. That's why Caiaphas rends his garments. You've heard the blasphemy from his own lips. What need of witnesses do we have? They were no good anyway, right? They weren't working for him. But now Jesus, he presents the convicting material of it, from his own lips. And so off he goes to Pontius Pilate. And so what happens before Pontius Pilate? Three times he'll say, I find no cause in him. Therefore, I'll have him scourged and release him. I love the logic in that saying. He's innocent. Okay. Yeah, so let's beat him to within an inch of his life. What's, what's he thinking here? You have to remember that outside the praetorium, there's a mob that's pumping their fists in the air saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he doesn't want to do it, but he's like, all right, here's what we'll do. I will parade him in front of all after I've beaten him to a bloody mess that by the time I say, ecce homo, ecce rex, right? Behold the man, behold the king. It's sarcastic. <laughs> That's a king? They're supposed to wag their heads at this and say, let the poor guy go home. But they don't. They just more intensely cry out, crucify him. And so Jesus is uh, put to death. Punches Pilate and say, I wash my hands. Have your way. Let his blood be on you and on your children. Right? And say, it's not on me. It's on, it's on you. But look at the scourging. This is important. Cru scourging was customary before crucifixion. But it wasn't customary to release. In other words, Pontius Pilate has to hit the sweet spot. He's got to get it so intensely uh, beaten and scourged so that he can convince the crowd outside. But at the same time, he has to not kill him, right? Because that's the whole point in the first moment. He doesn't have a death sentence, not yet. And so, interestingly, on the shroud, that's exactly the sweet spot that we find. In other words, the scourge marks are not over the heart. They knew not to provoke a heart attack. But we have 360 markings. Look at this. See this mark? It looks kind of like a dumbbell in miniature. This is the result of a Roman flagrum. That's the instrument of torture. It has these elastic cords that are made of leather, at the end of which are lead balls that weigh a lot. They are The wounds that we see inflicted here are comparable to a third-degree burn as far as the damage that it does to the body, even if they don't perforate the skin. Okay, so don't be fooled. Even if it doesn't, like in Mel Gibson's exaggerated version, if it doesn't tear and shred, um, it's still, look, you could fall off your motorbike and be laid up in the hospital for six weeks and not have shed a drop of blood. It's no less painful for that reason, okay? So we have this, these lashings, 240 on the back. I assumed it was just the back when I was a seminarian. But then when I studied this, I learned that 120 of those markings are on the front. And yes, it's head to toe, from the ankles to the clavicle. And even in the pelvic region, the wounds are just as deep as everywhere else on the body. And so there is no protective loincloth in the moment of scourging. He was utterly naked, which makes sense. That's the whole purpose, right? Put him in the public thoroughfare, make, it, make a statement out of him. So that people walk by and say, I don't want to do what that guy did because I don't want to suffer that, right? And so there's a moral element. There's a public humiliation beyond the physicality of these sufferings. I want you to see. All right. There's even a method to the madness here in the manner in which that the, these lictores, that these two men scourging, apply the flagrum. That is, Jesus, let's say, is in the center. And these... These men who are scourging are standing at one point, but they're pivoting in such a way that when they strike the extremities, the feet, the head, it's at always at an oblique angle. But where it, it strikes at the, the center of the body, it's more perpendicular, which means that they're standing and pivoting, and they each have their own arc. One from one side, one from the other. And that arc is discernible. It's measurable, it's consistent, and yet one man is taller than the other because one man's arc is longer than the other. 
Can you imagine someone in the 1200s marking out these, these shapes in such a way that just in case 700 years from now, a certain Monsignor Ritchie wants to draw a circle around each one, let's make sure there's some method to the madness, right? And so there is, and yet nobody knew it for long centuries. All right, but let's put down for a moment the lenses of a scientist and look to the scripture. I always am reminded of Isaiah 53. We read it on Good Friday, um, and it goes something like this. By his stripes, we were healed. Upon him was the chastisement that brings us shalom, that makes us whole, that brings us peace. Upon him is our chastisement. That which I deserved, the stripes that my sins merited, Jesus endures. He pays a debt that he doesn't owe because I owe a debt that I can't pay. And that debt is a debt of love. And that debt is paid in such a way that Jesus makes it manifest in blood. But for, to my mind, that opens up my heart to realize that Jesus, this is a picture of what my sins deserve. This is what, it's a picture of my sins do to you and to my own humanity. It, it breaks it. it, it it's a sacrilege against something holy. It, it, it desecrates that, that which is consecrated. Sin is serious. It disfigures the beautiful face of Christ. The crowning with thorns. It's interesting. If we were to make a list of all those people who were crowned and crucified, there's exactly one man on that list. Perhaps somebody else was also crowned and crucified, but if so, it wasn't written about in history. What then are the chances that what we have here is not Jesus? When we have these unique combination, crowned, crucified, scourged, pierced in the side, blows to the face, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what's unique about this is it's not what a con artist would typically depict. Isn't it true that everywhere in our museums, in our churches, in our crucifixes, it's a wreath like a ring that wraps around the head but leaves the top of the head exposed. That's what you would expect a con artist to do, but he doesn't. What's on the shroud is not a wreath. Instead, it's like a cap of thorns. Indeed, in the Middle Ages, many crowns were circles, empty in the center. A crown in Exodus, I think it's chapter 28, is what the priest wears. And you can see one in the Israeli museums. Guess what it looks like? A cap. Crowns were also in this way in the earliest centuries. That is like the one on the shroud itself. The, here's a reconstruction. The thorns, if made by the Zisivis Spina Christi, the Latin name means thorns of Christ, by the way, three quarters of an inch long. They're supple when the plant is green, but then they oxidize and become sharp as nails. They penetrate through the soft tissue to the bony plate below. The forensic doctors agree these thorns pressed to the skull. They were probably tied together with some sort of pliant branch, like a wicker, as you see here. It's not likely that a centurion is going to take three hours to make a beautiful braid. It's probably more likely that he just lops off a, a mess of thorn, stitches it together with some pliant branch, and then presses it to Christ's head with a sword or a spear. In any case, what you see on the shroud is the evidence of those thorns. That is, the rivulets of blood that flow from them, some 30 or 50 of them, in this area of the head, every area of the head. And now they accumulate here at the base of the neck. So remember, Jesus is vertical on the cross. He's lying now horizontally, but the evidence of that trickling effect is still seen in the drud, in the blood that has dried, but now re-softens and is absorbed into the cloth. This is extremely complex to show these blood flows, and yet they accord with what we know from the angles as Jesus was in the horizontal position after being first in the vertical position. We can even distinguish arterial blood from venous blood, the blood flow that looks like a, a three or a reverse three, an epsilon shape, as you see here, this is from the frontal vein. This, however, is from the artery at the
to that of a vein? Hardly. I mean, I've seen pictures of the circular storage system from those, it's, 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 it's humorous. It's, they just did not have the development in medicine that we have today. There's another cool little factoid here. See this um, shape? The end of it, there's a little globule of blood right here. You can kind of make it out from where you are maybe. At the center of it, there's like an empty space. I love this, juxtapose the sudarium, which has these amorphous blood stains, superimpose the one over the other, and the shapes match. And yet what's empty on the shroud is now filled on the sudarium. Evidence that these two cloths wrapped one and the same body. In any case, um, this is evidence of the crown. And I love that we get a picture of it, but I always say, sure, the natural light that we get from science is impressive. But it's when you put down the microscope and when you pick up the scriptures, that's when the really good stuff comes. That's where the real illumination happens. And I don't know if you've, you've ever done such a word study, but I was tempted one day to to go back and ask the question, where do thorns appear in the Bible? Because I had this trouble when I was in first grade in Miss Resnick's class and I drew a picture of the crowning of thorns. My spirituality went something like this. I would look to the, the crown and say, ouch. That was my deep spiritual thought, okay? And for long years, I think I, that was, it stayed the same. I don't think I ever really thought about it. Like what's the meaning of this crown of thorns. And this is where the scriptures help so much. So explore this with me for just a second. In Genesis 1 and 2 is where it describes the original garden paradise. And it says that, that there's every type of plant that had, food, that had fruit that was good to eat. And so guess what? There's no thorns in chapters Genesis 1 and 2. But in chapter 3, there is, because that's where the original sin occurs. And the Lord God says to Adam, after the fall, he says, he said, because you have listened to your wife and eaten of the forbidden fruit, that which I said thou shalt not eat of it, cursed be the ground because of you. I want you to think about that. The, there's, there's a curse upon the cosmos itself because Adam has sinned. And this curse is going to take a concrete shape. The very next verse, he says, cursed be the ground because of you. Thorns and thistles shall it bear forth, and only by the sweat of your brow shall you have bread to eat. And so from that page onward, the symbol of disorder and of sin is guess what? Thorns. Thorns are a motif that recur throughout the Old Testament. And in fact, the real language is, if you're very attentive, thorns and thistles. I wonder if that vocabulary rings a bell because it lands on the lips of Jesus himself. In his first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, he'll say, beware of false prophets. They are like ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. And I can just imagine the, the disciples standing by, great, Jesus, I really appreciate that. They look just like the, the ravenous wolves. I, that's, uh, these ravenous wolves are just like the innocent sheep standing by, great. Jesus says, I'll give you you'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? And the vocabulary there in Greek is the same as appears in Genesis in his Greek version, the Septuagint. In other words, Jesus knew that thorns were a symbol of sin. Grapes and figs, what is that a, a picture of? If not, the good fruit we're supposed to live, the, the love, the virtue, that we're supposed to produce. That's what we're made for. What's the thorns and the thistles? The bad fruit, the moral evil, the vice, the sin that we produce. Jesus spoke in such moral categories. He knew, in other words, that thorns were a symbol of sin. He knew he'd be crowned with thorns. And so put two and two together, together and this is what you get. That although he doesn't need words to say so, but just by wearing a crown of thorns, what he's suggesting to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear is that he's the sin bearer because on his head, he has the picture of thorns and thistles, stand-ins for sin, for evil, for vice. 
In other words, he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. That understanding, that theology, I think is readable if you know your Old Testament, especially Genesis 22. And this is my favorite part. Isaac and Abraham. Do you remember when Father Abraham, our father in the faith, in a test of faith, goes up a mountain that the Lord God designates to him on the third day? And he's walking up the mountain of sacrifice with the wood of the sacrifice, this only beloved son. And he says, hey, dad, here's the wood. Where's the lamb? Can you, can you imagine being Abraham in this moment? Like, what do you say? Sorry, kid, I don't know how to break it to you. You're it, right? Thankfully, he didn't say that. You can imagine, he says, instead, something quite poignant, something prophetic even. My son, God will provide the lamb. God himself will provide the lamb. But does he? Keep reading, and you'll see that he doesn't, not on this day, because when Isaac is bound and the knife is about to fall, the angel stays his hand and says, now that I know that you fear God, do no harm to the boy. And so Abraham spins around to see, do you remember what animal he sees? Oh, very good. Yeah, so a lamb was promised, but a ram is what they see. And more specifically, a ram with its horns caught in a thicket. In other words, the head of this vicarious victim that's going to die instead of the only beloved son, its horns are wrapped in a thicket. Its head is wreathed in thorn. And so there's a rhyme, not only with Isaac, the beloved son, and Jesus, but also this ram that is crowned with thorns, if you like, with Jesus. Think of this. That's not the end of the passage. The end of the passage is a renaming of the mountain. Mount Moriah becomes from that day forward, Yahweh Yireh. In Hebrew, it means the Lord will provide. What will he provide? A lamb. That's clear from the context of the passage. They're waiting for a lamb of God. And so doesn't that make sense of page one of John's gospel when the greatest of the prophets, John the Baptist, sees Jesus from afar? He's like, there he is, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Doesn't it all make sense now? Fast forward to Good Friday. Go to Mount Moriah or that particular mountain in that range called Calvary. And now stand at the foot of the cross and hear what the Pharisees have to say as Jesus is crucified. If you're the son of God, come down, save yourself, and we'll believe in you. Jesus, that's a pretty good deal. You want us to believe, right? You want, well, then meet their demands. Jesus is saying, as it were, you want to see power? You, 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 you want me to flex? Is that what it is? They're saying, you've got divine muscles? Show it, Jesus. He's saying, you want to see power? I'll show you power. I'll die and on the third day rise, just as I said I would. But for the time being... My horns are wrapped in a thicket. In other words, I'll take the blow. Give me your best shot. You can read this imagery if you understand that in Hebrew, one of the words for power or might is horn. Do you know that? When we say that the horn of my salvation is often translated a mighty savior, might, that word is horn in the original. So that makes sense. If you're a, if you're a ram and you want to show power, well, you charge with your horns facing out. If you want to defend yourself because somebody's attacking you, you charge right back. Horn against horn, muscle against muscle, fire against fire. Jesus, Satan, and all his enemies are launching a frontal attack. Punch back, right, is what we'd say. And Jesus is like, no, I got this. Give me your best shot. Concentrate all your power. Empty all your fury right here on me. I'll take it. I'll receive the blow. I'll descend into the darkness. I'll go to Sheol itself, but I'll rise right back out. And when I do, what he's saying in so many words is, that's it? That's all you got? See, Satan is a creature, and God is the creator. They don't duke it out in the match and say, like, well, you punch hard, but I punch harder. Jesus vanquishes Satan like the light vanquishes the darkness. There is no fight. 
And Jesus needs to show it. And the way he shows it is here. And so this crown is so emblematic of the kind of king that Jesus is. It's a paradoxical lordship, if I can steal the expression from Pope Benedict XVI. In other words, he turns rule upside down. Gentile kings lord it over their subjects. They kata exetsuadzo, that's they take authority and they shove it down their subjects. That's the literal language, to lord it over. That's what tyrants do, that's what despots do. Jesus uses his authority in the exact opposite way. He's a good shepherd who lays down his life for the sake of his sheep. And so that's the crown he wears because he's not like other kings. He's redefining for us what it means to rule, what it means to govern, what it means to participate in his, in his kingdom power. And that's the, that's the paradigm we follow. The crown of thorns, sure, it tells you a lot if you look as a scientist. It tells you a whole lot more if you look through scripture. Don't be ashamed of your faith. There's plenty to discern from the microscope, but there's way more from God's revelation. All right, so I want to um, close in the next seven minutes so I can take up your questions. But let's, let's look quickly to the last two mysteries. The first to consider is the carrying of the cross. We could ask, look, is there every, any evidence on the shroud that he carried this cross? We know he's crucified, but what about that interim period from the moment he was condemned and then that march towards Calvary, the execution site? Well, there is evidence of such a thing, but again, it's not what you'd expect from a con artist because we often see that T cross that weighs about 300 pounds or more. There's no way you can carry that three quarters of a mile, um, especially if you've been beaten, crowned with thwarts, scourged, etc. So what does he carry? According to the first century literature, you carry the patibulum, that's the horizontal beam. It weighs about 75 or 125 pounds, okay? The, the full cross, again, more than twice that, that amount. Okay, so what we see in the shroud are two excoriations, one on the right shoulder and then one on the left shoulder blade, exactly the part that sticks out. Do you know, when men who work on the railroad carry those big beams, they do it just like this. One third of the weight in front of them, two thirds behind. Those ups and downs, passers by, merchants. If you fall, you're gonna, you're gonna get scraped, the rough wood scrapes your back in just this way. This is after the hematidrosis, it's after the scourging. Now he's carrying this through the streets. Those excoriations correspond to the via crucis, okay, the way of the cross. If he didn't have his hands free, and we can only guess here, but remember, Jesus is crucified with a man on his left and on his right. Was there a chain gang? Was there a cord? Did he have his hands to brace himself when he, fall, when he falls? Maybe, but maybe not, because look, there's, there's soil that we can discern at the feet, at the knee and at the nose. We know it's chemical composition to be calcium carbonate with a touch of strontium. We know even the crystalline structure to be travertine aragonite, which is a very rare crystalline structure, and yet it matches the soil of the grottos of Jerusalem like a fingerprint, says one geologist. And so I always wanna say, look, if this was fabricated in France in the Middle Ages, what is it doing with Palestinian soil precisely where there's contact with the ground. But think of this, this means that he fell, and when he fell, first to his knee, but if sufficiently debilitated, he crashes down on his face, soil on the tip of his nose, 125 pounds, come crashing down on a crown of thorns. If that's me, I'm staying down. Like, what are you looking forward to? Calvary, when you're crucified? This is the love we need to contemplate when we make our via crucis. The Jesus that gets up again and again. That's the love we need to remember when we stumble and fall. And say, Lord, I'm not staying down. You got up, I am too. 
The crucifixion. This is interesting to consider. We often look at Jesus after the act of crucifixion, but I want you to consider the during. Think there's a transition moment, right? In a first moment, he's on the ground. The vertical piece is planted in the ground already. It's called the steepus. It has a fixture at the top ready to receive the horizontal beam that would settle right, right into place. And so you'd get two men to lift either end of the cross to get him up. But before that, think of this. You've got to stretch the victim out on the ground. 90 degrees, that's the angle between the torso and the arms. You would align the wrist with the pre-established hole in the patibulum. You would take a nine inch nail in your left hand with a square cross section and you'd place it in Destat's space. You wanna find the spot, just put your pinky and finger together, bend down 90 degrees. Now look under the muscle in your thumb. There's a little divot right here. This is called thunar furrow. The pointed nail goes in there. It exits out 1.5 centimeters higher on the opposite side, as you see here in the diagram. That, that's precisely where the ulnar nerve and the median nerve pass. That is to say, it's not just nerves that control the, the motion of your fingertips, but it's like sense nerves that are sending shock waves of pain through the central nervous system all the way to the brain, and this for three to six hours. We don't know exactly. how Jesus, remember there's darkness from 12 to three? So Jesus is certainly on the cross from those hours. But Mark says that he was sentenced at 9 a.m., and John says that he's in front of Pontius Pilate at 12 noon. But they didn't have watches that told, you know, to the second. They had instead three-hour shifts. And so if it's 10.30, you'd be equally likely to say 9 as 12. So we're somewhere in that window when Jesus is put to the cross. That means we're talking minimally three hours, maximally six. At least if you understand that Jesus lets out a loud cry, presumably right after three. That's a long time to be hanging from a cross, especially if you can't breathe. But before we get hanging, I want, to, I want you to consider how he got there. The first nail drives in, in the wrist. How do you get the nail in the other hand? Well, you stretch it out and you align, again, with the pre-established hole. What if, what if your wrist doesn't reach? You make it reach. You dislocate the sol- shoulder and then you drive in the nail. That's what some have imagined took place here. In any case, now, you have to, now you're made to stand up. And for at least a moment, all of the weight of the wood is on those two nails in your hands. And you can't even lean forward because you've got a crown of thorns on your head. And so these two men have to hoist you up and set you down on the, the vertical beam. And now all your weight is hanging on those two nails until you get one nail that goes through the feet, as you see here. And so to breathe, you would need to press down on the nail there in your feet. You need to tug and pull on the nails in your hands, and you're gonna twist, kind of throw out your hip. You're trying to release the tension in the intercostal muscles. Let me try to exemplify this. So when you breathe in, easy to do, right? When you breathe in like this, but then when you breathe out, easy to do when I can collapse my hands low like this. What if they're pinned high? All I can do is rise up with my feet and pull with my hands, and now I relax these muscles to make it easier to exhale. This is why we have the bifurcation pattern in the wrists. See that the flow of blood? See how it splits five to seven degrees right here? Why is that? Is blood dripping down and then dripping sideways? No, gravity stays the same. He's twisting, he's changing his position. Can you imagine this bundle of bones, these metacarpals? You've got a square cross section to this nail and you're gonna rotate around it? We We have soldiers in World War II who had an exposed median nerve, but no morphine. They preferred, some of them, to commit suicide than to endure the pain. This is a pain that is so unique, it gets its own word, at least in English. Did you ever pause to think about when we say, oh, the pain is just, excruciating. Did you ever pause to think that that comes from the the root word crux, crucis? In Latin, that's the word for the cross. This is a pain that is ex, that is out of the cross. This was engineered 
to be the sumum supplicium, as it says in the first century literature. That is the worst of all tortures. Do you know that they would, these Romans, they would protract your suffering. Sometimes they would give food to eat. The crows would have already pecked out your eyes, but you're still alive. You're not actually bleeding that much. It's only when they take the nails out. Now the faucet is opened, as it were. Now the blood can flow. But so long as the nails are still there, you're not bleeding all that much, not enough to die. They'd give you a little sedile, a little seat, so that you would endure longer. Two weeks you could last on the, on the cross. And yet Jesus would last only three to six hours. Can you imagine, therefore, how intense was his suffering before? How intense the scourging, the crowning with thorns, the mocking, that he's dead so quick? Even Pontius Pilate, what, he's dead already? You want his body down now? Yeah, he's already dead. Well, this tells us a little of the motion that took place as he's dying. What's happening is that your heart and your lungs are enveloped by a double membrane. It's called the pleura. And there's the pleura, the pleural cavity is that space between the two membranes. And it's filling up with your own body, body fluid, compressing the lungs and heart, making it more arduous for the heart to beat, for the, for the lungs to draw breath. And so Jesus, he's not just breathing, he's speaking. And seven times, he speaks these words. He says things like, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I love a little detail here. It says, not he said, but he was saying. He repeated that like a refrain in a song. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive. He's, he's praying for those who are torturing him, even in his own agony here. This is the divine love we need to contemplate. I guarantee you, if that were me up there, I wouldn't have said a thing. Forget that. I can't even, I, what is it to breathe? What is it to scream with a loud voice? He cries out at the end. Time you make your via crucis. Then Jesus dies, or so it says in the Bible. Any evidence of that on the shroud? Some have suggested, like our Muslim friends, they'll say, Jesus didn't actually die. Uh, he was he was brought to the brink of death, perhaps, and then we nursed him back to the health. You Christians added that tidbit about resurrection. Look at this. On the shroud, we see evidence of the pierced side. This is a 4.4... 4 to the heart, right between the fifth and sixth rib on the right side. And it corresponds to exactly what you will see in a museum in Rome, in the Capitoline Museum. This is from the third century BC. And look, between the fifth and sixth rib, you'll see a wound, just like Christ endured. Because the Romans trained to jab like this, with their left hand. By the way, if you jab with your left, you're more likely to, to, to strike the right side of your victim, as it is here, as it is on the shroud. And it corresponds to the Roman... Normally, they break their legs, but Jesus is the Passover lamb, not a, not a bone shall be broken. But they got to make sure, by the way, you understand that, under, that pra, it's called crurifragium, to break the legs, because now you can't press down on your legs. Now you can't rise up. You asphyxiate all the more quickly. But Jesus was already dead. And so they make sure of it by piercing his side. Out flows blood and water. Well, that's nice of you to say, John, but we can't see the water. We can see the blood. There's the blood stain. See where the lancea pierces? And under pressure, outflows blood. Now, if only we could see the water. Remember, with the naked eye, you can't perceive the water. But remember, 1978, these STIRP scientists, they're not looking with the naked eye anymore. If you look with ultraviolet fluorescence, that is, if you capture what fluoresces back when you shine UV at the cloth, what you see is that there's evidence of post-mortem blood here. That is, blood that's been separated into its component parts. The red blood, the corpulous blood, which you can easily see, but then imagine an outer glow, like imagine an outline around it all. 
I can't show it to you because it's ultra violetta. It's beyond the violet that natural eyes can see. That's the whole point. But there's evidence here of serous blood, the plasma, the plasma that is around this boundary. It was visible only in 1978. In other words, what we see on the shroud is exactly what the gospel records, but nobody had instruments to see it until the modern era. And so think of that. If this is the work of a con artist, to what lengths did he go? This, is, this isn't the blood of a dog or a cat, and it's not even that of a mere man. It's the blood of a dead man. Did a con artist kill a guy in order to get the right blood stain just so that we could know it in the modern era, centuries after his forgery? To my mind, that strains credulity, to say the least. All right, and I've already gone five minutes over, but I want to say a word about this because this is, imp this is important. Notice my language is precise. I know some people will speak of proof of resurrection. I try to be a little bit more careful. I speak of signs of resurrection. A proof is what comes at the end of a syllogism. It's necessary. It's inescapable. If you have the premises, a syllogistic conclusion is a proof. You can't avoid it, provided the premises are true. A sign is different. A sign is compatible, but it's not, it's not derived from what comes before. So here's, the, here's, an, here's an example. Um, let's, look, let's look immediately to the shroud. I want to point out two elements that I think are signs of contradiction. That is, they're compatible and they prompt the, the faith in resurrection. But that's a dogma that you give a scent of intelligence and will to. It's not, it's not a, being a Christian is not a matter of being an Einstein, right? It's a matter of a, a religious submission uh, of, of mind and will. All right, so what do we have here with regard to observable evidence? Two things. The body, first of all, is in rigor mortis. So this is that rigidity that sets in in the cadaver after death. Okay, so... Look, if we go down the street to the near, or behind the church, I suppose, to the nearest cemetery, we exhume a body. It doesn't look like this. Rigor mortis lasts for 40 hours, and then the body relaxes, and then obviously it begins to decompose and putrefy. There are no signs of putrefaction or decomposition anywhere on the cloth. In fact, there's not even a relaxation of rigor mortis. And so what it tells, look, if the knees are bent, it's not because there's a pillow underneath them. It's that he was bending his knees in the vertical position on the cross. He maintains that position. Perhaps it's clearest in the buttocks. You know, when you have a soft tissue, like on the tips of your fingers, and you press those to the window pane, they're pressed flat, right? That's not what happens in the buttocks. Instead, the curvature shows that he's rock solid. That's rigor mortis. Okay, the head. There's no support under the head. Instead, it's raised because he's locked in that position. He was hanging from the cross. All right, that's element one. Why is that a sign of resurrection? Only when brought together to the elements that I, that I show next. The next I want you to see is this blood stain here at the wrist. I want to describe fibrinolysis for you. Fibrin is that protein which makes the blood that is liquid become solid, right? So we have the coagulation of the blood. But now the blood in the tomb is going to re-soften. In other words, it's going to dissolve. That's the lysis. It's a dissolution of the fibrin. And now softened, liquefied, it passes from the corpse to the cloth. Make sense? Solids don't transfer, liquids do. This is a ticking clock. Forensic doctors love blood stains because we can compare to other blood stains and measure how long that cloth was, in, how long that blood was in contact with that fiber in order to be absorbed as such. The, what, what the scientists will tell you is that fiber analysis is interrupted between 30 and 36 hours after initiation. And so if you do the math with me, if Jesus is dead on the cross in the afternoon, remember, Pontius Pilate gets, gives permission Joseph of Arimathea, he purchases the cloth. He takes him down. He tucks him away in the tomb, presumably before the third star in the sky appears, because remember, it's the Sabbath. In fact, it's a solemn feast day, that, that Sabbath. 
And so they'd be eager, if they could, to go away, resume their labors after the Sabbath had ended, Easter morning. And so, and so they do. They go away. Calculate with me. 6 p.m., 30 hours later, puts us at midnight at Easter Sunday. 36 hours later, puts us at 6 a.m. All I got to say is our scientists, some scientists are suggesting that somewhere between midnight and 6, this blood is no longer soaking into the fibers. Why? Well, because the body is no longer in contact with that cloth. And remember, the image of the body is not just any dead body, but it's a body in rigor mortis. And so it proves that it's less than 40 hours, this separation from the cloth to the body. In fact, more precisely, it seems to be in a window of 30 to 36 hours. And yet, there's no smudging. There's no smearing. There's no evidence that somebody wrenched off the cloth and took bits of what was lying below with it. Haven't you ever taken off a Band-Aid? I always have to like count to 10 because I know a little bit of me is going with it. And so whoosh, you rip it off, you look back to the Band-Aid, you see the evidence of the violence that you just inflicted upon yourself. And yet there's nothing of that, not a smudge. The, the edges of that bloodstain, think of that. This is dried blood that's re-softened. It's now pasted. It's pasting the cloth to the corpse. And yet you're separating it in such a way that no evidence of displacement? Well, this is the observable data. We've got to try to make sense of it. And to my mind, the best sense I can make is that the body passed through, like, like light through a window pane. To my mind, there's a rhyme between the way Jesus... ...glory of the resurrection in a second moment. Remember, Mary is a virgin, not just before or after birth, but in her birth. Do you know that the fathers of the church describe it like this? Like light that passes through a window pane, Mary remains intact. Well, could it be that something similar happens with the shroud? That Jesus, as he passes into the new life of resurrected glory, is like light through the shroud? Look, he can get into the locked doors of the upper room, never mind that the, the doors were closed to everybody else. He can, he can show up on the road to Emmaus and then in Galilee, etc. This is the glory of the resurrected body. And this, this, this makes sense of the data we saw in John's gospel, that they saw the cloth collapsed. And when he saw it, the way he saw it, he believed. All right, I really am going to stop, and there it is. I'm going to share a song with you, and then I'm going to take up your questions, okay? This song is called... God's Face, and it's written by a confrere of mine by the name of Stephen Howe, and it's a contemplation that I hope helps kind of all the information that <laughs> I've, I've brought into our minds, I hope that it can now descend into our heart as we look to this face, which gives us a little sacrament of things to come, namely when we see him who lives forever face to face. All right, so here's the song. This man I hardly see Shrouded in silence Speaking to me Why is his story told In blood and lie What did our God Stoop down to write What will I let him Bring to life I see the nails I see the blood My tears go forth In a cleansing flood Why did my Savior Choose these chains for me if not that I should be set free So come, O oh Lord, and let me see I do believe that I see God's face before me Open my eyes, I want to see Your face before me I see the cross started with thoughts I see the world I see his back ravaged and ripped 
We have just a few minutes for questions. We want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Uh, but if you have a question, we'll take a couple of them um, so that we're certainly done by 9 o'clock. So does anybody have any questions? I'll bring you the mic so you can speak into the mic so that the people who are watching the live stream can ask. Here you are. Thank you, Father. Um, I've heard that um, the shoulder injury was the worst. And I think it was from a mystic. And I was wondering if... Um, any of the writings of the mystic was factored into your study of this? In what I said earlier, no, I didn't uh, use, but it's true what you say, and I believe it's Padre Pio who makes this sort of reflection that it, it was revealed to him that the shoulder wound was the most severe. It, it is true that we see these excoriations on the shoulder, um, but the mystics sometimes go beyond the mere uh, phys physiological fact then describe um, the pains that accompany them. And, and that we, it seems to me the shroud gives us no window in, into that type of the experiential side of it. But it's true that um, the, the mystics have described that this is what caused um, most pain. And so there's, it's just to my mind, it's a little um, glimpse, it's a little reference to all the unknown sufferings that entered into Christ's experience. You know, I, th I think of the, the, the weight of the wood. Come on, how much did it weigh? Sure, I can measure it in terms of 75 to 125 pounds, but the real freight that he's carrying is all of my sins, not just today, but from uh, all of mine, but from the dawn of time to the end of the wage, that's what he's really carrying. And, and I don't think we can begin to know what that means. Uh, I think too, of, remember what Jesus said on the cross, um, with regard to the darkness, he would say, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, just when you thought you were beginning to discern more deeply what it meant for him to suffer, he goes and says something like that, and you realize, like, oh my gosh, there's a depth to this spiritually that I can't begin to know. 
He's one with the Father. He's consubstantial with the Father. And yet he perceives his Father as having forsaken him. There's, he's entering into depths here that I don't think we can begin to know. What else? Anyone else? I'm coming. Meet me halfway. My cardio is not that good. Uh, on the, uh, the shroud, when you're showing the, the whole body, what was those markings that looked like a U? On the... That may be the, yeah, the, bar, the burn marks. The burn marks. Okay, I can maybe show a, a slide that um, I'm not, not sure, but let's go right back to the beginning. Oh, my gosh, I'm going the wrong direction here. Um, let's see if there's one that has the full length of the shroud. Somebody stop me if you see it first. But I, um, is, 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 it, is it there? Is it going to be here? Uh, these right here? These are water stains. Okay, so these are burn marks. Actually, these are patches over the burn marks from a previous. Now those patches have since been removed. But if you, you can just notice the lines of symmetry here. So the shroud was folded in half, in half, and in half again along one axis, and then in half along the center. And, uh, and so the water obviously accumulated in some sort, of, um, some sort of vase of sorts that left this water stain. Those lines of symmetry align with those of the burn marks. There was a fire in uh, 1532, and the silver case melted down, and the singed edges are what we see now unfolded, and that's why you have these symmetrical patterns. Anyone else? Come on, Keith. So has any additional carbon dating been done on the shroud? And um, I heard somewhere that there was coins or something on his eyes. So no, since 1988, no more testing, no more carbon dating has been done. Some have proposed that they'd like to, but they would like to do it as proposed originally. That is seven different um, samples from different areas of the shroud. They didn't unfortunately follow their own protocols, and no, after the fiasco of 88, no further testing has been done. And just to follow up, it's likely that if it's to be done, it's, only, it's gonna take an international consensus from centers of shroud study throughout the world. Imagine if in Mexico and in Spain and Poland and in America, they all suggest to the Holy Father, hey, let's do it this way. And they agree, and the, then, the, shroud, then the, the pontiff, who now owes the shroud as of 1983, can say, yes, go forward as you proposed, but no. And then the coins, yes, some have suggested a certain uh, Jesuit priest by the name of Phylas, F-I-L-A-S, um, proposed that he saw the lepton. It's significant because this coin was minted in 29 AD, and so if we have a coin from that time, it's, a, it's important for the dating of the shroud. But we should, have to be, we should be very honest about this. Uh, because of the effect of what's called pareidolia, this is when we see in amorphous shapes like clouds or in tree trunks or in grilled cheese sandwiches, you see, oh, there's Jesus' face, there's Mickey Mouse, there's the figure three or whatever it is. When we see amorphous shapes, we often project what is already well known to us, especially in religious phenomenon. This occurs exponentially. So um, I think that's probably the least scientific panel in some of our museums, the one that references, is it a possibility? Yes, it, it's, but it's a hypothesis and it needs further evidence before we can say, yes, this occurred. Okay, two more, we've got one here, hold on, and then one more. They say Jesus Christ was the worst of them. What was a regular crucifixion compared to Jesus? Um, there are other, ways of being crucified. If you go to Jerusalem, you can go to the Israel Museum, and there you will see evidence of one who was uh, straddling a stump, and the nails go through the heels laterally. And so uh, there's all kinds of grotesque variations that, that you could construe. But um, yet crucifixion was a commonplace. We know along the Via Appia, we had some 6,000 people that were crucified. Remember, Jesus would say, in his own ministry, unless you take up your cross and follow me, uh, you can't be my disciple. This he said before he was crucified. So crucifixion was language that was understood. It was a phenomenon. Jesus probably came into this world already in the shadow of the cross. 
Um, and yes, they had all kinds of variations, as, as I suggested. But what we know is what we see on the shroud. That's the important thing. Um, I, this is a, kind of like maybe a TV show thing, but what is the chain of custody from Christ's crucifixion to, to, to today? Good question. Very good question, and one I ought to have addressed. Sorry about that. Um, so here's the long and short of it. There are many books on this. I should differentiate, though. There's two segments in this history, and there's one which is absolutely sure, and then there's others which is our best guess. Okay, so what we know definitively goes from 1355 to our day. We know exactly, if we are to work backwards from the Shroud of Turin, which we now know, we could trace it back every baby step of it from 1355 onward. In 1355, it was in the hands of Geoffroy de Charny, a French nobleman, nobleman in northern France in a town called Lire. And it was on public display. He minted a medallion for pilgrims who would come to see it. We know his family, his wife, his, uh, the crest. Um, we know that it moved down through his descendants until Margaret had no more descendants. She sells it for two castles. It goes now into to new hands. It's in um, Chambéry in 1453. That's where the fire of 1532 took place. Um, and it's in the 1570s that now, when Charles Borromeo, Archbishop of Milan, and they're with a hub there in the northern Italy, which is, you know how southern France is Haute Savoie, the, the, the governing point is Turin. And even to this day, you have the, the palace there in Torino in four and a half hours north of Rome. Okay, so he was gonna cross the mountains to see the shroud, they said, no, we'll take it to you. Just see that it comes back. It never did come back. And now it's in the, it, 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 um, it was bequeathed from the Savoy family uh, when Umberto II, I believe it is, uh, passes away. He leaves it in his will to uh, the person who sits in the chair of Peter. So that was Pope St. John Paul II at the time. Now it's the possession of Francis. Okay, so where was it prior to 1355? Here, we have to put together little data points. The, let's move from Jesus. Jesus dies in 33. Um, according to the legend of Abgar, the, uh, it was Thaddeus Jude, one of the 12, who brings this imaged cloth to this leper named Abgar, who venerates it and is cured as, of his leprosy. And so he becomes a Christian. But his son takes the throne after him, reverts to paganism, persecutes the Christians, who go into hiding along with the shroud. And so the shroud is not known for long centuries until there's a flood in 525, and now reconstructing the city walls in Edessa in 544, they find this imaged cloth. And so obviously they're not gonna call it the Shroud of Turin, because it's not in Turin, but there are other names throughout his history. Sometimes it's the Mandilion, the image of Edessa, the Tetradiplon is, means four-folded cloth. Many historians understand that those names refer to one and the same cloth, namely the Shroud of Turin. So it goes from Jerusalem to Edessa, from Edessa to Constantinople in 944, modern day Istanbul. Um, and that's because Romanus I, the emperor, wants to bring together all the uh, relics of Christ's passion under his own roof. And so there it stays for about two and a half centuries. But in the Fourth Crusade, 1204, um, European crusaders sack Constantinople, appropriate the shroud, or at least a cloth that bears another name, um, and then bring it back into Europe. And so these are this is what's referred to as the missing years. What happened between 1204 and 1355? Well, all we know is that it pops up in the hands of a French nobleman, who, by the way, has ties to the Knights Templar. Some have suggested that, ah, they didn't want to wave their hand and say, oh, this is what I took, but they venerated it just the same, and when it was safe, or deemed to be safe, they put it on display. And so it raises the question, doesn't it? Well, could we find further pegs that show indeed this shroud existed? I think here is where you need to look to the iconography. Look now to the Pantocrator of Mount Sinai, for example. This dates to the sixth century. But what you're gonna see in icon after icon, that there are common points, there are called points of correspondence that show that the prototype that's being followed is nothing other than the Shroud of Turin. And so surely the Shroud that we call the Shroud of Turin predates 1355 because we have artistic testimony of that.
It is nine o'clock, and you've had a very, very long day, because I've been with you part of the day, and it's been a long day. So let's give it, Father, a round of applause. I would suggest if you're interested more in this topic, he's got a a great YouTube channel that you can see more information on. Um, uh, But Father, before we leave, would you please give us your blessing? Absolutely. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And Jesus, it's your blessing we ask for, for you are high priest and you are Davidic king who rule forever. And you told us that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst. And so, Jesus, as we praise you, as we glorify you, as we bring our hearts before you, we ask for your priestly blessing. Bless us, keep us from all evil. Increase our faith, our hope, and our love. Draw us into your sacred heart. Show us your beautiful face so that as we contemplate your glory, we might be transfigured from one degree of glory to the next. And so the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night. God bless you.